I'm a woman, I'm staring 40 um, down the barrel, I'm unemployed. The thing that I thought I was going to do for the rest of my life is, is sort of gone. And I was just like, oh my goodness, like what am I going to do with my life? It was a really big moment for me. It was really, really frightening. I'm not going to lie. Hello and welcome to the Coots Beyond Success podcast. I'm your host, Laura Jackson, and with me is our resident Coots expert, Greg Kyle Langley. And together we are unveiling success and asking our guests what comes next. I'm very excited by today's guest. I'm not sure how she's fitted us in, to be honest. She's a radio presenter, a broadcaster, an author, a speaker, a stand-up comedian, and an ex-political advisor. She was voted one of Scotland's most influential people on the left and in 2016 was awarded an NBE. But what's next? Aisha Hazarika, everyone. Oh, thank you so much for that kind, kind introduction. I mean, you have done lots of amazing things. When do you have time to sleep, basically? Good question. (laughs) It's a question I ask myself a lot. Sleeping would be really, even just going to the shops would be quite nice for a little poodle around the supermarket. I am really, really busy, but I do love what I do. But yeah, I am quite time poor and sleep deprived. And menopausal. It's a really good, it's a really winning combination, I have to say. It really is. I mean, how how do you order your life then if you do it all? Or is it just very chaotic? It's it is a combination of, you know, when the job needs to be done, it, it's very well organized. I'm very lucky to have a, a great team of people around me. Actually, a great team of women around me. Um, I've got a fantastic set of of agents. I've got a brilliant lady who helps me with my diary. I've got a really good like team on the financial side, my bookkeeper and things like that. And without them, I definitely just couldn't function. So they organize it quite well. Anything that's left to me on the personal, that, then it all falls apart. So the <laughs> professional is very ordered and then everything around the edges is just absolute unbridled chaos. But you have had a really amazing career in politics. You're a stand-up comedian. You've straddled both actually at the same time as well, which is uh, quite the feat. Um, Although I'm not sure. I think a lot of people go, you were a stand-up comedian. What was the next natural thing? I was like, working for the Labour Party. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your humour must have got you through though, right? <laughs> my my humour did get me through some very bleak times in comedy. But also, I think humour is a really fantastic tool for any line of work, particularly where communication is involved. And, you know, Mm. politics is very much the art of communication. And I think what gave me quite a good advantage in politics was having a sense of humour. A, you know, making people laugh is is great in terms Mm. of like getting on and and Mm. getting up, but also for writing speeches, for doing big debates in the House of Commons, like Prime Minister's Questions. You know, the ability to come up with a a good line or a good joke is great because sometimes, you know, you can convey a really powerful message through humour in a way which is much better than if you just wagged your finger Mm. and lectured people. Well, I think it's more human and I think it's more... Um, it's easier to understand for the every person who who maybe isn't knee deep in in politics to actually understand what's going on. And you, th- you throw a joke in there, then maybe we'll kind of remember some of the legislation that way. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Although sometimes you would write a really good joke for your politician, then you'd watch them mangle it, mm. <laughs> and you'd be like dying inside, going, "No, you needed to wait a beat before you gave the punchline or whatever." So yeah. it was quite, it was quite sort of high, high wire. Although in politics, sometimes people really do laugh at you, but for the wrong reasons. Mm. I mean, well, you've had quite the pivot, then, haven't you? Because you know, from politics, you have gone into broadcasting and all of these amazing things that you do now was that quite daunting did you know where you were going when you left politics no I really didn't have a clue and it was a very interesting point in my life because I was just about to turn 40 and I had worked in politics for really all of my adult life really since the age of like 21 I'd been in, I'd been a civil servant to start off with mm-hmm. and then I had um I had a short spell in business but then I had become a, a political advisor for the Labour Party And, you know, I had been through good times with the Labour Party in government and then very bad times with the Labour Party uh, as we lost power and were in opposition, which was a very difficult time. And I kind of imagined that I would spend the rest of my life in politics. I thought that I would be an advisor for the Labour Party, really probably for the rest of my life. And I was quite sort of happy with that idea. I thought, yeah, I'm quite comfortable with that. And then suddenly everything kind of changed in the political landscape. We lost the 2015 general election campaign. 
there was a big leadership contest within the Labour Party and the party went down a, a very different political direction. And suddenly I didn't really feel that my values kind of aligned with with where the party was. So I sort of felt like, right, now is the time to to leave. But it hadn't really been part of the plan. So suddenly I'm 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 a woman, I'm staring 40 um down the barrel, I'm unemployed. The thing that I thought I was gonna do for the rest of my life is, is sort of gone. And I was just like, oh my goodness, like what am I going to do with my life? It was a really big moment for me. It was really, really frightening. I'm not going to lie. Like some people run towards change. I I very much don't. I I like knowing what uh, up until that point in my life, I really like to know what I was doing and I like to have a plan. So I really threw myself in the deep end. I decided that having spent this huge stint in politics in Westminster, I was going to give myself some time to breathe to sort of figure out what it was I really, really wanted to do. And It was quite high risk in the beginning because, you know, I wasn't earning anything. I was watching all all my other friends get jobs, often big corporate jobs. You know, people were speaking to me about those jobs. But I thought, I just want to try and do something different. And I got asked to do a few TV slots, sort of reviewing papers. I think the Andrew Mm -hmm. Marshall invited me on. um, And I did that and really enjoyed it. And then I got asked to write a piece for the New Statesman. It was a bit of a sort of diary. And I think they thought it was going to be, you know, quite grand and and sort of, you know, here's my lofty thoughts from high above, (laughs) having been a very, very important person in politics. But instead, I wrote this quite self-deprecating, but very honest and quite funny piece about how the mighty had fallen. And I'd gone from being the big I am in in, in my little skirt suits and heels striding around Westminster to there I was basically having nothing to do, sitting in my pants, watching the daily politics, shouting at the television. (laughs) This is what I've been reducing used to and people really liked it because I think they quite liked the honesty Mm -hmm. and they liked the humour and then off the back of that I just started to get more and more offers about writing work TV work and then it all kind of just went from there but at the beginning it was difficult I think for about a year I was very much like have I made a huge mistake with my life you know um, is this going to all end in sort of glorious failure what's the plan after that but thankfully touchwood it seems to have worked out mm. and did you feel like i'm actually starting again from scratch is that is that what those feelings were yeah absolutely and i actually think it was quite a humbling experience because when you have been a very senior political advisor you're in an incredibly rarefied position And that is because of your proximity to powerful, famous politicians, senior people. So everybody rings you. Your phone never stops ringing. You get invited to everything because people want to, you know, people want to hear what you've got to say. They want to get some tidbits about, you know, what your boss is saying. And then so you are kind of a big deal and you can be quite arrogant at that stage in, in your career. But when you leave that job, you're kind of, you're sort of a nobody. You have to start all over again. And I remember the best piece of advice that I got was from another um, political journalist, somebody I really, really look up to. And he took me for a coffee and he said, this is going to be really tough for you psychologically because you are literally, you have gone right back down to the bottom of the pile again and you've got to start again. And he said, be really, really humble. And he also said, say yes to everything. Just don't think that you're too big or too important and at the beginning probably people aren't going to pay you for for your work but just you know if you want to do this just be humble really graft work really really hard say yes to everything make yourself available and just be nice to people and just really 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 work hard and that was actually incredibly wise good advice from him how do you how do you say yes to everything but still curate it so that you're not wasting time? Good question. (laughs) And one that I'm still struggling with. Look, you know, I think saying yes to everything, apart from some things, obviously, (laughs) um, it is really, really important. But you, you, look, you only have a finite amount of time. You only have a finite amount of time. There's only so much stuff you can, you can do. And I think one of the things that I probably need to do a bit more work on is, is saying no to things. I hate saying no to things. I always think, if I say no to this, I'm potentially closing off an avenue or turning down an opportunity that might not might not come again. Um, but, you know, there is only so much you can do. And, and my agents are very, very helpful with that. They will kind of help filter a lot of stuff um, out for me. But I think the way to sort of choose 
what you curate, which is a great word, is, you know, I think you have to set yourself some tests, which is, and not all of them are financial. Obviously, if a, if a gig comes in and it's massively, massively well paid, then that skews it. But there are some things that have been very well paid, but they haven't quite sat with what I believe in and I've decided mm. not to, to do it, but not to make a big deal about it. I think as well, you have to think about, look, what, it sounds a bit, you know, a bit over the top, but what's your brand, not so much a brand from the outside world, but what's your brand to you? Yeah. Like what makes you feel good about doing something with another organization, with another individual, with a, you know, who, whoever it is, what kind of partnerships do you want to have? And if the, I actually, for me, money actually comes down a little bit further. The first thing I look for is, do I naturally feel excited about this? You sort of think, if you don't want to do something in five months down the track on a cold sort of November, Wednesday morning, then don't say yes to it now. So I think you've got to think about, you know, does this does this make you feel excited? Do you feel good about working with this organisation? Like, do you, do you think they're impressive? Is there a person that's really impressive? Do you like what they're sort of doing? And also, like, does this fit with where you want to to kind of go? So that that's the kind of things I sort of think about when I'm mm. when I'm making the decisions. But I do I do need to learn to say no a bit more. I think you obviously had a job speaking for other people, but how was that when you went into the world to find your own voice and put your own voice out there? It's really interesting because that was something that. I did think about a lot. So when I was writing speeches and, and jokes and, you know, working with, with politicians, you know, often it was, you know, working with them. But obviously a lot of my voice was going into what they were saying. And I did definitely have a yearning to get my own voice out there. And that greatly influenced my decision about what I did next after leaving politics. And I did think you know, do I want to take another job where I'm behind the scenes again, being the the voice of maybe a, an organisation or, or a senior individual? Or would I like to put my own thoughts and ideas and observations on the world? And I really decided that I did want to find my own voice and I did want to use my own voice. And it was actually quite difficult at the beginning because I was quite used to you know, writing for other people and write and thinking about the parameters that politics sets where, you know, you, you, you've got to stick to a line, uh, your party line, you know, you can't go off too much in, in one direction. So when I first started, I was actually still probably thinking like a political advisor and talking a bit like a political advisor. It took me a wee bit of time to just be a bit braver and actually really sort of think, right, what, do, not, not what do you think as Aisha, former Labour advice, but what do you think yourself mm. uh, and to get it out there? And one of the things that I did actually find really helpful was that I'd had this background in, in stand-up comedy before I went into the Labour Party and I wasn't allowed to do gigs while I was working for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. <laughs> you can't really be Why not? <laughs> briefing the press during the day and then being like telling sort of rude <laughs> jokes in, in the evening. But um, when I left politics, I kind of weirdly made this bet with a, a brilliant, brilliant woman in the arts. And she had said to me, because I was very confident we were going to win the 2015 general election campaign. And she was like, if you don't win, you know, you should do something in the arts again. And I went, I think you'll find we'll <laughs> definitely be winning that election cut to like totally not winning that election and she got in contact with me and she's like okay we we made a bet and you said that if you didn't win you were going to do something about your life as a woman in politics and you were going to use your humor and so I ended up doing this stand-up show kind of about my life um in the Labour Party as a there weren't many female advisors there were certainly very few uh, people of color um around the, the senior parts of the party and I don't know if you remember, we had had this kind of mad thing involving a pink bus. Uh, you're yes. laughing yeah, yeah. a lot, Greg. And um, that's that's the reaction it got. <laughs> and so I called it Tales from the Pink Bus. And it was a kind of like a, it was a sort of one woman show about my exit from politics. And it was really good for me because A, it was fantastic. I had a great time doing it. And it was, you know, it was received really well. And, you know, I sold out at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival for a couple of shows there. But it really helped me mm. find my voice, literally because there's nothing more kind of throwing yourself in the deep end than doing a stand-up show and having a packed audience and you've got to go out on stage and make them laugh. So I feel like that was the thing that really sort of helped push me 
into that zone of, of actually, you know, right here is your voice. You can say exactly what you want, but just make people laugh. Do you think that that show was the vehicle, excuse the pun, to oh, find... Very good. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Here all week. <laughs> um, to, to, to find your voice and the authority in this new space, which would be broadcasting. Definitely. I think that that show, along with all the other broadcasting and writing work I did, was two things. It was so good for my confidence because, you know, you, you've got to really put yourself out there to do to do a stand-up show. And it is, you know, it, it, it is quite a lot to do that. So I think from a confidence point of view, it was like, oh, great, I can actually do this mm. and I kind of enjoy it and, and it was fun. But also I think it changed how other people saw me because I wasn't just another political advisor coming out from politics because there are lots of political advisors not who, not any that are coming out and doing stand-up well, exactly <laughs> exactly so there's lots of political advisors who come out and they you know maybe write a column yeah. or they might do but they there weren't any political advisors coming out and then like going to the edinburgh festival and kind of mm. like selling out the edinburgh festivals i think that gave me quite a kind of unique position which was because you know in a lot of the media, it's about having a slightly different angle from people. It's about having a slightly different edge. And as it was, you know, being female, being a person of colour, you know, being a woman of the left, you know, of colour is kind of interesting. But the the kind of comedy gave it another dimension. Just going to the word selling out again, because it, that is a real moment of success, isn't it? And one of the things that we've been hearing from people is they don't always reflect on those little moments of success they just look backwards from where they are now how, how long had it been since you did your gig before that you then had your career in the Labour Party and you did it again so to have achieved that must have been incredible your your comeback tour it it, 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 it was so good I mean it sort of it was kind of slightly surreal actually I remember um taking my show to the Edinburgh Festival and um the team that I was doing it with were like you just they around me they're like you're just not going to believe this I was like what they were like all three nights have completely sold out I was like what <laughs> I was like are you absolutely sure and then I got really paranoid I was like oh maybe somebody has bought the tickets to sort of spike the show and like one of my mm. enemies has bought the tickets and then we're going to turn up no one's going to be there it's going to be some terror and they were like no we've checked it's actually real human beings that seem to have like bought the tickets so no that was a really 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 lovely moment I kind of I'd like to say I was able to totally enjoy it in the moment, but I think the reality is I was also so nervous because mm. hadn't done stand up for for a long time, and also I did feel I was really putting myself out there. And there were lots of people who were coming, you know, from the press, and you know, I'd also had like you know political colleagues and friends and things. So I felt like the stakes were really, really high. So I think it was when I look back on it afterwards, I enjoyed it, but I think it's very difficult. You look back on things that have gone well and you're like, when you look back now and you think, God, that was that was really good. But at the time, you don't quite live in yeah, the moment. You're just yeah. panicking. All It's a bit like, you know, when you look back at yourself from pictures 20 years ago and you're like, my God, I look good. But at the time, you're like, God, why am I so fat and ugly? And you look back on yourself and you're like, God, I do anything to look like that. It's a bit like that. I think those moments that, why are you laughing so much, Greg? <laughs> Rude. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, you, you know, I think sometimes success is you look back on things yeah. and you're like, yeah, actually, I did... I did really good, but at the time you're like, oh, I'm not doing good enough. And and you're so, you know, stressed in the moment. You can't really like luxuriate in it. And it's really interesting to hear you talk about how humour has been such a powerful tool and, um, you know, lever for you in your career. When did, when did you first recognise humour as a superpower that you had and what did it help you achieve? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I think it's when I was really, really young mm -hmm. because when I was very... We like a small girl in Scotland. Like I think I went to school and I was like four or five. I had a really, really hard time at the first school I went to. And there was actually quite a lot of, there was not a lot of like um, black or Asian people in the outskirts of Glasgow. And we went to this, I went to this like local school and I had a really, really tough time for the first two years. And I think it's, you know, I don't think any of the kids were like deliberately horrible, but they just hadn't seen anybody like me. And I did have a really, really difficult time. Nobody wanted to talk to me. Nobody wanted to like hold my hand on the plain ring or ring of roses or anything. Mm -hmm. Some kids did make some quite horrible comments to me about the colour of my skin and things. And then I moved to school, like I moved, went to like an all girls school and I just had like the space where nobody really bullied me. 
and I kind of got the speak, got the chance to kind of develop my personality a bit. And I worked out quite quickly. I was probably age about seven then. One of the things I recognised quite quickly is when I was allowed to speak, I made people laugh. Mm-hmm. And I cottoned on to this as like a protection against getting bullied because I'd been really badly bullied and when I was about four or five. By the time I was six, seven, I was like, right, I've got to figure out how to not get bullied. And if I can make people laugh, that's obviously something I can do and that's going to protect me from getting bullied. So I think that's kind of where it where it came from at a, on a really sort of primitive, primal level. I mean, you're the daughter of immigrant parents. How do they see your success? Are they happy and proud of you? Well, I think they'd probably be more proud of me if I was a doctor (laughs) (laughs) or if I was at least married to a doctor and had pumped out some children. No, they are, they are kind of, they are proud of me. I think they're sort of slightly kind of shocked and bewildered at what's happened to their daughter, basically. They were just like quiet Indian couple minding their own business and then they <laughs> see their daughter like blaring out on the TV and radio and, and writing incredibly <laughs> opinionated pieces. But I do feel, my parents have been, I think at the beginning it was really hard for them because I remember I did, one of my first ever spots on TV was this late night show and it was me doing stand-up was such a long time ago. And I told my mum and dad, which was a massive mistake, because my mum and dad being sort of really classic, stereotypical, like Indian parents were told everybody, every Indian person, (laughs) basically from sort of Barnsley North, got the message that I was going to be on TV. They were like, you know, she is, you know, she's like going to be the, my mum was like, she's so funny. And my mum had never even seen me. She's like, she's going to be amazing. And sorry, she's not Welsh, just that's a very bad Indian accent. It's like, so literally like Britain's Asian community watch me on TV that <laughs> night. My dad's told all his patients in his surgery and I saunter on and my parents are all excited. It's about half 11, half quarter to midnight. And I just basically do seven minutes of absolute unadulterated filth. <laughs> it was awful. It was absolutely awful. But I was starting stand up at that point. You know, I was like, oh, you to be in the stand up circuit, you've just got to be really rude and really blue and really practically pornographic. It was horrendous. I mean, when I look back on it now, I, even I cringe. My parents were so mortified because literally the whole of the Asian community in like Scotland was watching. My parents were getting messages like like a death had happened in the family sort of thing. And my dad was so cross with me in, in a typical this is, I, this is how I could tell he'd integrated into British society. He didn't sh- phone and shout at me. He wrote me a very strongly worded letter. Like it was a complaints letter to the BBC. <laughs> what did it say? It was like, dear, dear daughter, I, as your father, did not come to this country to have my name dragged through the dirt, <laughs> completely humiliated. He was just like, you have complete... So there was a bit of tension at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, but thankfully, I think we're in a sort of better place now. But I think they are kind of... They are proud. They've come to see me do stand-up and they're sort of... Um, you know, they like it when they see me on the news or, you know, if I'm on a sort of big political mm. show or something like that. But like I say, I still think they would have preferred it if I was a, a doctor. The closest thing I did get was I did get... Um, I got awarded very kindly by my university, Hull University an honorary doctorate in law. So oh, I felt perfect. like I felt that was at least something. Yes. I was like, come and on. An MBA. Come on. You've got the floppy hat. That's yeah. I know, I know. We love to ask our guests on the show what is written down in their notes app on their phone because we feel like it gives us real insight into the person that you are, organized, chaotic, lots of thoughts going on. Um, would you be willing to be vulnerable today and share what is in there? Do you write notes? I do. I bet you do. How many have you got? Well, I've got thousands. Have you? I am such an avid note. Oh. Like I feel that notes are, so I, I'm a diarist. Like I love, I've kept a diary since like the age of 13. Um, oh, wow. That's the next book, everybody. <laughs> yeah. There we go. But what's really interesting is that like most of it hasn't really changed because when I was 13, I basically wanted to lose weight and get a husband. And now that I'm 47, I still want to lose weight and get a husband. Except when I was 13, I also wanted a perm. Thankfully, those days are over. <laughs> right. So um, here we have one from uh, last week. There's quite a lot of swearing in it. So again, I'll just like, basically the whole thing is about how exhausted I am. <laughs> it's basically me being absolutely, bleep bleep knackered and it's me basically doing kind of a list of what I've got to do this is this is me getting ready to go to the um, political conference season and I'm really stressed out and I'm really exhausted and there's just me moaning about being exhausted a lot of swearing I can't believe I've come on this podcast and I have literally revealed to you about my, <laughs> this was not the message I wanted to land <laughs> On a, on a podcast about success. <laughs> I mean, you've got a lot on your plate right now. I'm, it, 
I honestly, I don't know how you managed to juggle it all. <laughs> um, so we've talked about, you know, your previous career, how chaotic life is right now. But Aisha, the big question for you is, what is next and how are you going to achieve, you know, the next goals? That's such a good question. I mean, that is a question I do ponder a lot and it's, I don't really have a kind of a a clear answer on this because I think a lot of my, this latest incarnation of my career has grown really organically. It's Mm. sort of evolved. Um, It's not really been like, ha ha, I want to have, you know, my own radio show on this. It's kind of happened and I've loved it. So I think quite a lot of what comes next is is just sort of keeping going and like staying Mm -hmm. in the game. I don't know if there'll ever be a point where I kind of think, I've won the game of life here. I just don't think that's kind of in my character. I think I am quite, always quite anxious and a bit insecure about what I'm doing and and what comes next. I think there's a bit of a, and I think that's actually kind of a bit of a bad thing. I think it would be good to be in the moment a bit more and just be like, actually, I can just enjoy this. But I think there's always, probably always going to be a little bit of a knowing, you know, is this enough? What's next? You know, how long is this going to last for? What's the next thing? But I do hope that, when I get, as I get, what my big ambition is that I really love what I'm doing now. I feel really grateful and really gratified and dead, dead lucky. I would like to stay in the game and keep going with it. You know, I look at the people I look to who I genuinely think are truly successful, not just successful by metrics of fame or or fortune, but they are, they're, they have accomplished a lot in their field. They're really, really well regarded. They still have a great passion for what they do. They have great authority in their field. They're still really respected. And they're like in their late 80s and they're in their 90s. And they are, they're fit, they're mobile. They still have a great lust for for life. And they seem really content. They are still working. They still love what they do every day. That's what I'd like to be. And also we're going to have to work till we're about 140 now anyway. So I figure like that's probably quite a useful thing to think about. But that sounds like you're never going to have a rest. I don't think I'm ever going to have a proper rest. Okay, I had a holiday over the summer. I had a rest and I actually started to feel really, really anxious towards the end of my time. I did have one week on holiday where I really quite enjoyed it. But then when I came back, I had another week and I started to get really agitated. So I think I'm somebody who is actually incredibly bad at sort of, you know, kind of having downtime unless I go full feral, as we discussed earlier. So I actually think I'm probably better suited to always have like a level of work going on. I think I, my brain and my character can't quite function if I don't have like really like structure to my day and structure to my week. I don't focus well on just like, hey, just waft around for a while. I can't waft around. I can't do baking. I can't do laundry as we've... I just can't do like normal things. I just, I need to work. Mm-mm. I think I'm a, I am a proper workaholic. But then I, I like how that success isn't defined by one moment because for lots of people it is. And it's really nice to hear somebody's story about success that is just keep going and just have authority in that space and be happy and confident in who you are that I feel like that sits really well with me I interviewed a fantastic brilliant actor recently who sort of and I was asking him about his illustrious career and what was next for him and he had this great phrase which is like a career is something you you look in our game a career is something Mm -hmm. you look back on when you're in it you just keep going and Mm -hmm. you just you just keep saying yes to things a bit like the first advice I got you know that I thought that was really interesting And I think there's a certain truth in that. There's a certain truth to just to keep being quite humble and keep keep working and keep doing things. But I certainly think one of the aspects that I absolutely love about my world at the moment, particularly with my radio show, is getting the chance to have great conversations with people. And I think if I was bold enough to sort of think, right, what would I really like to sort of develop next is maybe getting a bit more in depth in in certain topics, maybe 
doing some documentaries where you sort of really, really get under the skin of, of a topic and, and sort of dive into something. Mm. I think that's the kind of thing that I would like to do more of because I think I enjoy doing lots of news, which is very fast paced, but you're often, you know, you dip into lots of different topics in quite a superficial way. I think the idea of kind of really delving deep into, into something is is something I'd like to do more of. Mm. I, you know, I feel really, really grateful. I feel really privileged to have the platforms and the opportunities that I do because, you know, it hasn't always been easy for people with my background, a woman from an ethnic minority um, community. I remember when I first started out in, in life when I was in my early 20s and I'd done a course in journalism and I remember applying to like literally every radio station in London, every newspaper in London, just offering to come and work for free and, and got, just got knocked back left, right and centre. Whereas other friends of mine with, you know, obviously traditional British names got in, you know, for the work experience scheme mm -hmm. and things like that. So I feel like, you know, 20 odd years later, I feel really, really pleased and proud to have been, you know, to have these opportunities. But I also think you still have to work really hard. I don't think somebody like me can ever really take my foot off the pedal. Like I always feel a bit of anxiety and a bit of insecurity sort of thinking I could get this taken away from me. Someone's going to find me out and 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 take 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 this away. Someone's going to realise that a huge mistake has been made and, I, and, and I'm allowed to do these things. Mm. So I think that like anxiety always sort of nips away at you in yeah. the background. From all the different things you've done so far, you know, you've talked about basically imposter syndrome still, you know, someone could just take this all away from me. Does it all add up to feeling any more secure at any point? You know, the fact that you know you're a great stand-up comic and you can just you can come back after 10 years and still sell out Edinburgh. You can you can always go back and write some hilarious announcement announcements about regional development agencies for the DPI. <laughs> you can you can you can still do all this stuff. Like, does it help you feel secure? It should do. And and hearing you say that and put it together, I think the sort of logical part of my mind goes, oh, li listening to that, that should make me feel quite secure. That should make me feel. But I think there'll probably just always be this thing, which is just the anxiety that, you know, somehow it's all going to go wrong. I think I've probably got a bit of me and I think quite a lot of creative people have got this streak in them where and definitely comedians have this because part of what we do is we exaggerate everything for, for comedic effect which is good from a work point of view but from the downside of that is we catastrophize yeah, everything right. as well like you know you can't just have a bad day at work everything is over for me now it's mm -hmm. you know it's, it's kind of very dramatic and it, I'm, I'm great to live with by the way an absolute <laughs> joy an absolute joy but do you know what I mean? So I think that I think because of that quirk of the the kind of person I am, I think a lot of comedians have this, and a lot of creative people have this. We we're all we're just kind of quite sort of anxious a lot of the time, and this this idea of of everything falling apart and everything kind of being sort of catastrophic is 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 sort of slightly haunts us, but it keeps us it keeps us nimble and it keeps us on our feet as well. But there's there's at some point you would think, look you hit a sweet spot where you, and I've definitely got closer to that place. Now I definitely feel more, I feel more confident about my voice. I do feel like, you know, I've earned my place as being a, you know, good broadcaster, which I absolutely love doing of all the things I love doing, being doing broadcasting is I'd say the absolute sort of priority. Um, and so I now at least have less insecurity about, you know, can I do this? You know, I did go through a big phase, which is like, am I even any good at this? Can I actually do it? And I feel I've kind of proven myself on that level. I've proven that to me. You know, I don't have like a dark night of the soul where I'm lying in bed just going, actually, I I'm faking this and I'm actually not very good at that. I don't, I don't feel like that anymore. But you still do have that anxiety about, you know, you know, what's happening with what I remember during, you know, the pandemic, which was a really, really stressful time for all of us. But, you know, a lot of my work is doing live events and hosting award ceremonies and, and doing after dinner speaking. A lot of it is, you know, doing live work. And that came out of nowhere. And just watching months of curated work, which you had, you know, me and my agents and my team had spent a long time filling my diary, just watching that go blank 
you know, over days as, as you know, we've learned about the pandemic. And then, of course, we went into lockdown. I think for a lot of people in my position doing the kind of work, that level of panic, I think that will stay with us all for quite a long time because, mm-hmm. you know, we lost so much work in, in the space of a few. So I think that's always what will kind of slightly be in the back of our mind as well. I just feel like can't ever, you never know when something like that might be around the corner. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're going to move into the last section of the show. I feel like we have learned so much about you, but if you could go back and give yourself some life advice with all your successes that you've had, what would it be? I think to be a bit more courageous, because I think when I was younger, and I think when a lot of people are younger, they are really, you know, worried about their abilities and and what they can do and it's quite scary kind of going into the world of work and thinking big about what you might want to do so i think probably just to be to be a bit braver and take more risks because it is good to take risks they do largely pay off not always but i think mm. the more you do you get a better sense of how successful the risk is going to be and do you have any future goals that Greg here can help you with anything personal, but oh. any goals like personal goals or business goals where, you know, anything that you've set for yourself recently. Well, if, if Greg is here to help me, I'd quite like a Scottish castle, Greg. I feel <laughs> like that's the next step Greg? for me. Any, you can assign me a check. I'm How does sure this we've work? got a number of clients who would um, <laughs> gladly hand you over their castle for the right sum. Maybe they give me a discount. Mates Possibly. Mates yeah. I feel like I might be a grandee in, in a Scottish castle. That would be nice. But in terms of, um, Possibly more realistic goals. Mm. I mean, that's realistic. Is it? Yeah, come on, think big. Think big. Yeah. I, I do spend a lot of time on right move looking at kind of Scottish castles. There so you go. There you go. Uh, Greg is going to sort me out on that. He's absolutely. looking really worried. <laughs> but to be absolutely serious, I would like to have a bit more order in my life. Like it is a bit, it is a bit chaotic around mm. the fringes. And I think it would just be quite nice. I think it'd be good for me. But also things like, you know, looking after myself, like, you know, health and well-being and all that sort of stuff. I think, you know, when you're as busy as I am, you actually do need to kind of schedule that stuff in because work can just take over everything. So I think that would be um, a kind of sort of general kind of mechanics of life sort of goal. And then in terms of professional goals, I do love storytelling and diving into interesting debates and discussions in my broadcasting. I think I enjoy that the most. And I think if I could develop my career in any way, it would be great to sort of do more of that. And I think documentaries provide that sort of vehicle where you can really get under the skin of a of a subject, whether that's an individual or whether that's a particular policy issue or, or a social issue. Um, I really enjoy kind of immersing myself in a, a, a topic and exploring it and digging it, digging out the really interesting strands of different stories within that. So I think that would be a bit of a professional mm. goal. I mean, Greg, anything on the organisation, number one? Well, I'm sure we can help in some way with the castle through our network. And the, the broader thing around, you know, having a platform is something that lots of people we speak to it's helpful for them to, it's different for you because you, as a broadcaster, you probably know exactly down to the last number, the literal size of the platform you have because you know you get your listener numbers in. But recognising that platform, getting out of the day-to-day and realising what an opportunity you have to change minds, to lift other people up, to unlock doors for other people, even if it's just through the power of what you're saying to them and the, and the example you're showing them, um, has been something that lots of... Um, I think our guests and some of the people that we speak to outside of this have found really powerful because it, it reminds you of that impact that you're having on the world and the people around you. Yeah. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely yeah, amazing. I've, I've really loved it. Thank well, you. Thank you too. I've had such a great time. It's basically saved me some money on therapy. So thank you so much. <laughs> it's not saved you any money. There is an invoice coming. <laughs> Thanks to everybody for watching or listening. Don't forget to hit follow and subscribe so you don't miss out on our next Beyond Success guest. See you later.